We're going to look at Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20, verse 20. The Bible says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. So, basically, Noah built an altar for God. And took of every clean, ble uh, every clean beast. Now, remember, there are clean and unclean beasts that are mentioned, which we saw at Genesis. So, before the law of Moses, there was common knowledge about what clean animals are, what unclean animals are. And also, there was a common sense just of building altar sacrifices for the Lord. If you keep reading here, he took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, so he took every bird that was considered to be clean as well, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So then, he that's self-explanatory. Uh, any burnt offering, he offered it on the altar to the Lord. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, so because God, the Lord God, smelled a savor, so that's that smell that comes out, that is very sweet to God. The Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. So God said in his own heart that he's never going to curse the ground. So remember, God cursed the ground at the book of Genesis chapter 3, which we might recall. He cursed the ground with uh, thorns, and then he cursed the ground when Cain, he messed up in his own sin. So we see several times where the Lord cursed the ground, but this time he says, look, I'm done. I'm not going to do it anymore. So God is done cursing the ground because of that uh, offering that Noah gave. And the Bible says it's a sweet savor. Now, usually when you smell all that smoke, it's not something where you would call a sweet savor. It would be suffocating. But to man, whatever they see as suffocating or putrid, the Lord would take it as the opposite and say, no, actually, it is sweet to me. That's what God would say. It would be sweet to him. So sometimes when you give your sacrifice or your savor to the Lord, we have to understand that to the world it might be considered something as st stinky, putrid, or disgusting. But to the Lord, he takes it as something that's sweet to him. So, that's how you get on God's good side where you, he can uplift the curse or no longer curse. Now, did you hear what I just said? So, this is how you get on God's good side then, if you want to learn how to get on God's good side. How you do that is you make a sacrifice that is sweet to him. So, when you offer up a sacrifice to the Lord, God, He tends to show more grace and mercy. Listen up now. He tends to shed more grace and mercy and doesn't give you as much as you deserve to be punished or deserve the curse if you offer a sacrifice to Him. Okay, so that's going to be very important. That way you can know how to get on God's good side. The importance of sacrifice. Go to Hebrews 13, please. So we see a case here of sacrifice to God. Now, how do I give a sacrifice? I can't obviously find some uh, innocent sheep out there and then slaughter it for a burnt offering. I probably have half of my women leaving my church after that. So... But, uh, joking aside, if we were to look at Hebrews chapter 13, I'm holding three pens over here. I'm still getting used to this. <laughs> All right, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 13. The sacrifice you give does not have to be something that's physical. It's something that is spiritual. When you offer a spiritual sacrifice to God, He honors it. Notice right here, the Bible says, Verse 15, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice. Notice what kind of sacrifice this is of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. So one of the things that pleases God when you sacrifice to him, you'll notice one is considered to be praise. Praise. 
So when we, that's why we sing hymns. That's why we say amen. That's the reason why sometimes we'll shout. Some of you might not understand that. Some of you might say, well, you know, that's a little bit uh, abnormal. That's out of hand. You can just, you know, sing a bit. You don't have to praise the Lord. No, God likes that because it's offering a sacrifice to Him. It may be strange and putrid to you, the smell of the sacrifice. But to God, He takes it as something that I like that. All right, let's keep reading here. Verse 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So there are several things. Thanks uh, at the last part of verse 15. Doing good to people and communicate is actually offering. So it's offering to the Lord. So you give monetarily. You give uh, financially to the Lord. And that's what he's pleased with as well. So, why do you think the Catholics, they get a guilt trip over their sins, and then the Catholic Church takes advantage of that by saying, you know, if you give money to our plates, then the Lord will absolve you of your sins, and you're forgiven. See, the devil, he takes something out from the Scriptures, and God, he don't approve of that anyways. Uh, let's look at the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. But there is something that has a point here, is that basically the Lord, He appreciates a sacrifice where you give money to Him, where you thank Him, where you praise His name, where you do good to other people. Now think about it. If you do this much for the Lord, don't you think that the Lord, He's going to go, you know, I'm going to give Him a little bit of more grace and mercy. And I'm not going to uh, curse as much as I did before. So that's the reason why it's important that what you're doing for the Lord, just keep it up. I think that's the reason why a lot of you aren't dead yet. I think that's the reason why a lot of you, God has not cursed yet. So just keep up what you can for the Lord and just uh, do the best, of you, best that you can. Remember, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And He's going to take what... Uh, you can give to him. Notice that money is one of them. Look at verse 17. Not be, Philippians 4, 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Notice that the gift Paul received, verse 17, money, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing. To God. Okay, let's go back to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis uh, 8, excuse me. Thank you. Genesis chapter 8. Now we're going to look at uh, verse 21 again. The Bible says, For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So uh, God's saying that the imaginations within all of mankind is always going to think evil, imagine evil, ever since they're young, ever since they're born. Keep reading. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. God says, uh, neither, uh, not only will I not curse the ground anymore, I'm not going to smite. I'm not going to kill. That's the idea. I'm not going to, again, kill any living thing. Uh, that moves on the earth like I did, as I have done before with the flood. So, this is both an encouragement, but also something negative. But to be quite honest, it should be something more positive than negative. Okay, the negative thing is, no matter um, how much mankind boasts on how much good of a person that they are, they're wicked, evil people no matter what. Look at Romans 3, Romans 3. No matter how much you boast on how good of a person you are, you will always be evil, you will always remain evil, and you will always think evil. Why? Because you're just an evil person. You're not that good of a person like you thought you were. That's important to understand. And people cannot comprehend that. They hate to hear that. They think that it's hate speech. But no, actually that is truth. And why that should be positive to you is because God says, I am not going to curse anymore the ground or kill anything. Why? Because mankind is just too evil. So, no because they're going to be evil anyway, 
I'm just basically what? Giving them grace and mercy. So, even though you are so evil and wicked, you know what? God's grace and mercy extends towards you, and He is not going to smite that ground, just like He did back then. God is not going to curse anymore. It's going to be gone because it's called mercy. It's called grace. Now, that should be something where it should make you thankful. People take it for granted the breath that they're breathing every day while cussing out God's name, while criticizing Bible-believing Christians and shutting down their churches, and they take that thing for granted. They think that this is expected. This is what I deserve because I am such a good person. That is extremely spoiled mentality, you realize. And such people are wicked and they deserve to burn and fry in hell forever. Now, does that sound strong to you? If that does sound strong to you, your mind has been spoiled and warped too. Because you got to realize that God, He should have shot you to hell billions of time a long time ago. And for you to expect something more from God, because I am good, look what I've done, you have, you, I don't know what help you need except the 10 psychiatrists combined and you need to be on drugs. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. What a spoiled, wicked generation we live in. Sometimes, I hate to say this, but sometimes I wish that God would just curse the earth. Just curse the people and open their eyes a bit and get them out of their spoiled mentality. There's one thing that I hate is a spoiled, rotten mentality that think that they deserve a handout all the time and abuse my wonderful God's grace and loving mercy. But you know what? The Lord gives me a job to extend the same grace and mercy to these people and to give them a chance. And God will cast judgment at the right time. It's not me to do so. It's the Lord. All right, let's look at Romans chapter 3. People don't understand who they are. We're going to look at Romans chapter 3 and then notice at verse 11. Uh, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Right? Everyone's sin. We're always going to be evil. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. No one's interested to seek after God. Business, life, school, success, fame, money, promotions, having children, a lover in their life, etc. Verse 12, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. So notice that they do not profit. Notice right here that the Bible says they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. Uh, so God says they don't profit to me. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now that's very clear. That proves that no one is a good person. You know, the general understanding is when we meet a person, in my eyes, the person is a good person. Right? That's what we normally think. But then God's, in God's eyes, He says no. Verse 13, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips. God says their mouth is full of sin. He says their lip is full of sin. He says in verse 14, their mouth is full of sin. Verse 15, their feet is full of sin. Verse uh, 18, their eyes are full of sin. So, notice that basically everything from head to toe about you is just full of sin. Yeah. That's how God sees you as. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back. But like I said, this should be a positive thing to you. Mm -hmm. Why is it positive? Because God says, you know, I just know how rotten and wicked you are, but it's okay. I'm not going to curse you. I'm going to extend the grace and mercy. How about that? Okay. Let's uh, look at verse 22. Let's look at verse 22. While the earth remaineth. So God says that while the earth is still standing and it remains. Seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So God's saying that day and night is never going to cease. It's not going to stop. Uh, including all these other terms, six, six of them, sea time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, and winter. Now, for some of you who don't know, in the Bible then, Palestine 
would have about approximately six seasons then, according to the scriptures. So here are the things that you might want to write down and know about, which you didn't know before. So Dr. Upman says right here, this is found on his Genesis commentary, page 233. It reads here, The reader should observe that there are six seasons in Palestine. One seed time. Okay, in your Bible, right? That's the first mention. That's October and November. October and November. Two, winter. That's December and January. December and January. Three, cold. That's February and March. February and March. Four, harvest. That's April and May. April and May. Five, summer. That's June and July. June and July. Six, hot. That's August and September. August and September. Dr. Ottman explains it this way uh, for their region. In October and November, the first frosts come, yet blowing and sowing go on with, uh, plowing and sowing, excuse me, go on with the late grapes and olives in Galilee coming out. The trees begin to lose foliage, uh, foliage and the snow begins with hail in November. However, corn is still sown. In December and January, grass and herbs spring up, the almond tree blossoms, and sometimes barley is sown. In February and March, the oranges and lemons ripen, and the weather turns chilly one more time. Winter figs are present, and with them the latter rain. In April and May, wheat in the year shows up, and barley harvest comes. The rivers swell, and clouds without rain pass over, with excessive drought, uh, drought conditions in many parts. In June and July, there is a heavy dew early in the mornings. Wheat and rice are harvested, and the early figs ripen. Grapes and olives ripen the last part of July. In August and September, the heat increases as the pomegranates ripen. The grapes are harvested, and just before the early rain, it is very hot and dry. Wow. So that would explain all the six parts over here for verse 22. Now, uh, in your Bible, uh, what's important to understand when you look at verse 22 here, the Bible shows that with, uh, there are six seasons, right? Now, before that time of the six seasons, I mean, you didn't get a time where people, they suffered so much from the atmospheric conditions where uh, their age was shortened and they died in earlier age. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this. Remember, it didn't rain before. I showed you that before. It didn't rain before during Noah's timeline. So what that means is this, is that the atmospheric conditions, it was, it was likely to be very steady and healthy and good conditions. That's the reason why when you read Genesis 5, the people were living around average 900 years. But then after Noah's flood, because God changed the atmospheric conditions, and the biggest evidence is when God sent down the rain, right? When he sent that rain, it, when it didn't rain before, it changed the atmospheric conditions. When God sent the atmospheric conditions, then you got where they get hot and cold and all these six. So, it might be likely or possible, I'll just say possible in case, that they didn't have these seasons before Noah's flood. Now they launch and start these seasons here. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 9 verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons. So God, he, uh, not, he was so pleased by the sacrifice that he blessed Noah and his three sons. Remember, they are Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So when God blessed them, he said to them, that I want you to be fruitful. So that means to produce a lot of fruit, to uh, bring forth a lot of children. And multiply, so spread out, okay? Multiply and multiply. So one begets another and begets another. That's the idea. And replenish. So that means to fill again. Why? Because the population died out, 
So God says, I want you to fill again the earth. Now notice when God said that to Noah, he gave that same command to Adam at Genesis 1. Go to Genesis 1, 28. Genesis 1, 28. So why would God tell Noah to replenish Because the population died out. We know that. So he's trying to fill the earth again. Right? We all know that. That's why God told Noah to replenish. But the thing in uh, the thing here is that Adam was also told the same thing to replenish. Why, that's pretty strange. Why would Adam be given the same wording as Noah? That doesn't make sense. Why would Adam be given the same wording as Noah to replenish unless there was a population before Adam that died out. And that's the reason why, if you recall in Genesis 1, uh, I'm not going to expound it over here because I've given you a, a, a lot of verses for it, the Genesis gap. The Genesis gap, basically, that there's a gap at uh, Genesis 1-1 one, one, and Genesis 1-2-3 that basically that there was a population uh, before, there was a population before Adam, and that was Lucifer and the sons of God. They lived there, and God sent that flood, universal flood, and drowned them all out. And that's why God told Adam to replenish. Same thing with Noah. God sent a worldwide flood, and God told Noah, I want you to fit, replenish. So it's common sense that the Genesis gap is very clear in Scripture then. It would make sense. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. See, that same command is given to Adam. Same wording, just like God told Noah. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. Now, the evidence of the Genesis gap is extremely apparent. And even liberal, unsaved, left-wing scholars will admit that. When they examine and study the Bible, there's too many similarities with Noah and Adam, they see. So then they realize, and that's why they come up with the false conclusion that some of the uh, descriptions about Noah, the writers m may have copycatted from uh, what the earlier writers wrote about Adam. So basically, these later writers writing about Noah were copycatting the earlier writers what they wrote about Adam. Why? Because it's just too similar. So even lost, unsaved liberals undoubtedly realize they share a relationship that they come up with such a false conclusion. We have a scriptural conclusion that they do have that strong connection and relationship, we admit that, but it's not that because the writers, they were copycatting each other, it's because they were in the same position, Adam and Noah. There was a population before them. Now, I don't understand why saved believers don't understand that strong connection and that strong relationship. See, if they deny that, then how are they going to answer the unbelieving scholars? Because the unbelieving scholars uh, see this strong connection. There's no doubt about it when you read the text. Uh, if you read Dr. Upman's Genesis commentary, he'll give description after description. Uh, me, I won't do it right here. But basically, uh, Adam's son, uh, one of them was cursed, and then the other one was the good guy. Same thing with Noah. One of his sons was cursed, the other one was a good guy. We see that um, uh, uh, another example is that Adam sinned through the fruit, right? Mm -hmm. Noah sinned through the fruit as well. Adam was told to have dominion and rule over the earth. And Noah was given that same command as well to, uh, to rule over the earth. Adam, he was in charge of the animal kingdom. And then Noah was given the same command in charge of the animal kingdom as well. And there's just too many. There's just too many. And then another one is Adam was told to replenish. Noah was told to replenish. And then you make that, the distinction won't make sense right there. Won't make sense. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 9 verse 1 now. Uh, verse 2, verse 2, excuse me. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. So God says that from you, there's going to be a fear and a dread from you that's going to be upon 
The, every beast of the earth, all the beasts of the earth, they're going to have a fear of man. All right, mankind. And upon every fowl of the air, so that includes every uh, bird that flies in the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, that's any living substance that moves on the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, so even all the sea creatures, into your hand are they delivered. God says that they're delivered into your hand. Why? The delivering to your hand. It's like catching. It's like a prey. Because of verse 3, they're going to eat them. So, uh, before I explain that part, verse 2, that's why animals and humankind, there's a fear between us. Why animals are scared of you. So, because there's, uh, there's a fear and a dread of mankind, there is this conflict of animal nature and human nature. And it's always going to be there. Now, that shows that before Noah's flood, there was no fear and dread of animals with each other. Uh, animals and humans, they all got along well in harmony. That can also explain why people lived up to 900 years as well. Because the animals and the humans, they lived in harmony. But that also explains, which I'm not going to get into, but I taught you last time, that also can explain why maybe they were getting too close back then, right? So that verse should be eye-opening to you. Why did God put a fear and a dread all of a sudden between animals and humans? Because they were just getting too close to each other. Because of, remember, I, show, I taught you last Genesis study, so I'm not going to explain it again here. But you remember Genesis chapter 6 and the book of Jude, it showed you the disgusting, disturbing thing where the sons of God and then the offspring after it, they were mingling with uh, not just humans, but with the animals as well. The animals. So it's become very disturbing that time. So then the Lord, because he realized this, he says that this relationship, it's a big no-no. So God's going to put a fear, a distance between them. He's going to put a distance between them. So there is a fear now. Let's look at Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. But God, He's going to restore the harmony again. When? When, right? He's got to make sure that those sons of God are not ruling over the earth. That's important. So if, if they have zero chance to rule over the earth, then if we follow the logic here, that the reason why God put the fear and the dread is because of those sons of God, right? Those fallen angels. Then unless the fallen angels don't have a hold on the animals and human nature, then God can restore the harmony. It makes sense, right? That's pretty simple. Then we have to think what's the only time period in the Bible that the fallen angels won't have a chance to rule over the earth. You have to put a God in there to bring forced military dictatorship and control. And that way he can make sure that the fallen angels have zero chance. Well, then what's that time period if you know your Bible? It's the millennium then. You got it. Isaiah chapter 11. That's why the Bible says at verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So when Jesus Christ starts to rule over the earth, at verse 4, he slays the wicked. So see, fallen angels won't have a chance at verse 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So then what can God do now? Now he can allow the harmony. At verse 6, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them and the cow and the bear shall feed their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the ass and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's the reason why, because God makes sure that He's there and everyone knows about it. Okay, let's go back to Genesis 9. Genesis chapter 9. Now let's explain the last part of verse 2 and 3. So, 
into your hand are they delivered. The animals are delivered into our hands so we can catch them. We can hunt them, so to speak. They're delivered to us. Why? Because we can eat them at verse 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Now that's important to mark down. Anything that moves on the earth, that lives, God says uh, you can eat it. That will be your meat. Now meat is an old English word for your food. That's the idea. So, it's going to be your meat. It's going to be your food, God says. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. So, God says, just like the green herb, so all the plants, God says that he gave to us all the vegetation and plants for us to eat. God says it's the same thing for anything that moves on the earth, any of the animals. So, notice right here that people who would try to cry out to you, that, no, if you know your Bible, uh, God forbids eating meats and you're supposed to eat vegetables. You're supposed to be a vegetarian. That kind of mindset, you'll notice there's only one place they can get that from. There's only one time period. That's the Jewish Mosaic Law. But if you look at uh, what the Bible says, at before the law, this is before Moses' law. You know what God says? At verse 3, every moving thing you eat. How about that? So it shows right here, this is evidence. Genesis 9, 3 is evidence that you can eat anything and that if people tell you that, no, you can only uh, eat certain parts of animals and uh, you should live like a vegetarian, that they're only getting it from the law of Moses. That's proof that that proof text, that idea of idea of theirs is only in the law of Moses. That's important to understand. But God knew that uh, before the law of Moses you can eat anything. Look at 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4 is extremely strong and we're going to look at Acts 10. Acts 10 and then we're going to look at uh, Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Uh, not Philippians 4. Why, why did I say that? 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4. Everybody, I'm so sorry. My brain is really mashed potatoes today. There's too many things in my mind that I, I had to manage and organize today. So y'all forgive me today, okay? All right. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And then we'll look at Acts chapter 10. So the Bible shows that we can eat meat then. Okay? And we can eat anything. Meat and eat. That's it. All right, Acts chapter 10. Now, notice right here, this is the starting point of when the group of Gentiles were accepted by the Lord. Okay? Remember, before the Gentiles were accepted by the Lord, what was God focusing on? Jews, right? So then, because God was focusing on Jews, what was the diet, obviously? It's, uh, you have to abstain from certain uh, animals, unclean animals, and uh, vegetarian diet is ideal. But then, let's say then, if that only applied to Jews, and God's uh, switch from Jew to Gentile, then that law is no longer applicable, right? Well, let's see if that's the case when God switched from Jew to Gentile. And let's see if that law is no longer applicable. Look at Acts chapter 10. Notice that the Bible says at verse 9 would be better. 9, on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now what did God tell him? At verse 12, wherein, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth? Just like Noah, all moving things on the earth, right? And wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Right? Because he's a Jew. But verse 15, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And verse 16, God did it three times. Yeah. To make it very sure that you can eat. You can eat. 
Don't believe what Seventh-day Adventists say. That's what God said three times, all right? That's what God repeated three times here. Now, notice how Peter interpreted that. Because how Peter interpreted that was because of that dream that God was turning to the Gentiles. Look at Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. When the Jews got in trouble, uh, the Jews were troubled, Peter said at verse... 8, uh, verse 7, And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath, cl hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And then notice right here, at verse uh, 12, And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. And then you'll notice right here that the Bible says, verse 17, For as much then as God gave them the light gift, the Gentiles, as He did unto us, Jews, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Uh, verse 18, the last part, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repenteth unto life. See, so uh, Peter interpreted that, interpreted that as when God turned to the Gentiles. That's the reason why I could change this diet. Let's see if that's truly the case. And that's not just a dream or my own self-interpretation. Good look at 1 Timothy 4. Notice Paul repeated that. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 3. Uh, verse 1 and 2. What did Paul say? Doctrine of devil and lies, right? Yep. On what? Verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. That's the doctrine of the devil. That's considered to be a lie. Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So see, God cleansed it. Why? Based on His word and based on prayer. That's why we pray all the time before we eat. Alright, look at Genesis 9. Genesis chapter 9. And we're going to look at verse uh, 4. Verse 4. All right, now there's a lot of heresies we're going to be covering, actually. You notice we already covered the heresies at verse 2 and verse 3. 4, 5, and the other verses we're going to cover their heresies too, all right? The next heresy is verse 4. But flesh with the life thereof. So God says any flesh on the earth, any body, any body out there that has life thereof, what did God say? When he sees a living flesh, which is the blood thereof, God sees that there's blood inside it. Shall he not eat? God says, You're, you shall not eat it. So you cannot eat blood. That's very important to understand. So God says here that you're not supposed to eat blood. And it's also possible at the beginning of verse 4, it seems like that God also condemns cannibalism as well. Because it says flesh with the life thereof. So not just the blood, but flesh. So notice right here that there's something that God condemns to eat. What is condemned to be eaten is basically blood. That is extremely important and possibly also even cannibalism. Now, looking at these passages, I want you to go to Leviticus 17, and then we're going to look at Acts 15. Leviticus 17 and Acts 15. Now, notice that this is condemned before the law, during the law, and after the law. This meat eating was before the law and after the law. So it is important to understand these rules that God gave out concerning about the dis dispensations right here. Amen. All right, we're going to look at Leviticus 17. And keep your hand there even after we're done reading, okay? Because we have to return back there to cover a certain heresy. So Leviticus 17, notice that God, He forbids the eating of blood. Leviticus chapter 17 and then we'll read verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, 
and I have given it to you upon the altar. Look at verse 12. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood. Keep your hand out Leviticus. Go to Acts 15 now. Notice after the law, the New Testament, Christians are forbidden to eat blood as well. Look at Acts chapter 15. And then we're going to read verse 29. Verse 29. That ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood. See that? And from things strangled and from fornication from which if ye keep yourselves ye shall do well, fare ye well. So notice right here that before the law, during the law, after the law, God forbids the drinking of blood. So I don't know why Catholics uh, vehemently defend that this is the blood of Christ and they'll bet their soul on it too. That is, I don't know why you would do that. God forbade before, during, after the law. That's nearly all dispensations. Don't eat blood. Yeah. That's what God said. Yeah. Uh, it makes you also wonder too, there are, some, uh, there are some writings that say, if we are to think for common sense, that at verse 2 and 3, God put that rule because there was something going on here. Wouldn't it sound logical that God did something with this because there was something going on back at Genesis 6 too? Isn't that interesting? That could be very possible. You might say, why is that? Because remember, how did the sons of God produce offspring? Remember that? Because they have no blood. I taught you that Genesis 6. How they do that? Unless they intake human blood. How about that? Maybe they were eating bodies too if God tied out to cannibalism as well. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Oh, and by the way, in the tribulation, you know what they're going to do. There's going to be blood drinking and cannibalism. Why? Because those sons of God are coming down again. Wow, isn't that interesting? I just threw that in there, all right? I just threw that in there. So it's possible that Genesis 6, something strange was going on when they did that. Uh, because the Bible says as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be what? In the coming of the Son of Man, tribulation timeline. Tribulation timeline, we know those sons of God, they're eating uh, people and drinking blood. So then, as it was in the days of Noah, who was sound logical, Genesis 6, they did the same thing too. Wow. All right. Genesis 9. Uh, let me throw out another thing right there, all right? You dug up conspiracies where some people will claim that they were eating uh, human flesh, drinking blood. You ever heard of those stories? Or they were doing satanic sacrifices, some of the elites. Why? Because it's supposed to receive power or something like that. You've heard some of those abortion clinics, which is very strange. I had some people working in there or like people who were involved in there. They mentioned how there are these people like undercover. They would like give some kind of money or something to take some baby parts with them. For eating because it's a delicacy or something. That's disturbing, isn't it? That is wicked. That's evil. That's very evil. So it is going on today. It's going on today. There are baby eaters right there. There are baby eaters. How about that? Wow. It's All right, let's go back to Genesis 9. Genesis 9. So uh, it's all tied to the sons of God, what they're doing. Why? Because they want to receive power for some weird reason. It's supposed to receive power. It's supposed to connect themselves with satanic forces, be closer to them. All right. Uh, you know, I'm just having golden nugget after golden nugget in my head. You know, Leviticus 17 mentioned about soul receiving atonement from the blood, right? There's something that's some kind of spiritual power that God... Uh, sees it as at Leviticus 17. Maybe the sons of God are looking into that. Maybe I'll do a deep Bible study on that one day. I just opened up Pandora's box. Okay, let's 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 go to let's go to Leviticus 17. All right, now let's cover the heresy here. The heresy is from Jehovah Witnesses, where they'll say blood transfusions are forbidden. It's anti-scriptural. Why? Because you are eating blood when you do blood transfusions. Now, some of you are just going, where do they get that from? But see, the idea uh, in their mind, it's this. They're getting so nitpicky that they see it as when uh, basically you're uh, being nourished, you're receiving strength from another human's uh, blood inside you. So it's like you're eating, so to speak. That's how they deem it to be. 
But uh, there's a faulty logic with that because one, uh, we're all guilty of that then because don't we receive the nourishment from our parents, uh, from our mother's blood as well when we get born? See, so then we're all guilty of that. So God's not thinking that. Otherwise, God would violate his own scripture, you have to realize. Not only that, if you look at Leviticus 17, verse 11, this supports blood transfusions. The Bible says, for the life of the flesh is what? In the blood. God sees that when you receive blood, you have life. That's why blood transfusions are important. Why? So that when you have blood, so that you can have life in the flesh. But when the flesh don't have that blood that's needed, then what? The flesh is going to die. That's important to understand. That's why God gave the nourishment of the blood when we were all born as well. Why? Because that's our life. So see, God wouldn't be against blood transfusions. Another thing is this, is that when you read verse uh, 13, it's very apparent what God deems to eat blood. So, you have to look at the scriptural wording of eat, not the Jehovah Witness right, mindset right. of eat. The Jehovah Witness mindset of eat is putting blood inside me and taking some kind of nourishment for myself. That's their definition of eat. Who says so? Uh, don't they boast about knowing the Bible really? Right. Well, if they do, then they don't read their Bible. What do you think the biblical definition of eat is? What do you think God's idea of eating is? It's a simple idea like you literally have a bowl or a plate right in front of you of that thing and you go like this yeah. that's literally eating that's the idea of eat in the scriptures because look at Leviticus 17 13 and whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten See that? You think that's like a bird transfusion that God was talking about, about eating? Or do you think he meant like this for eating that bird or fowl? That's what he's seeing in that context with blood as well. Keep reading verse 13. He shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust, for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. See, God says the blood is given for life. That supports blood transfusions then. See that? The blood is given for life. That would support blood transfusions. Keep reading. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. How about that? So it's, it's literally just eating something, like catching something, and then you eat it like that. All right, let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. We're going to look at uh, Genesis chapter 9, and then we'll read verse 5. Verse 5. All right, the next heresy here. There's a lot of heresies, as you might notice. And surely, so that means certainly, right? God's going to say, it's like a matter of fact, it's going to happen. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. God says, as a matter of fact, for certain, your blood, human blood that you have, mankind's blood, of your lives, God's going to require of it. He's going to make a demand of it. What's the demand? What's the requirement? Keep reading. At the hand of every beast will I require it. So basically, uh, so that's a metaphorical expression, at the hand of every beast. So the beast that has a hold of the life, right? Right? God's going to require something from it if that animal takes a hold of a human life. That's a metaphorical expression of basically taking a life. See that? Which means kill, obviously. Yeah. Murder. That's the idea. All right? That's why we say taking a person's life, right? That's the idea. That's the expression here. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. So when a person takes another man's life, so at... So take, use your hand, so to speak, to take it, right? So at the hand of every human, at the hand of every fellow man, right? So that means every man's brother. He's going to require it of them for that life that they've taken of man, of humans. So we see right here that God, he requires capital punishment at verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood. If you shed that blood from man, right? When you kill him, shed his blood. By man shall his blood be shed. That same man, his blood has to be shed too. That's capital punishment. That's not, uh, 
That's not something that's considered to be cruelty. That is scripture, actually. We're going to look at the book of Numbers, all right, 35. Numbers 35. To call it a peaceful demonstration while taking away lives and calling it a peace, a, a, a summer of love, and etc., and doing nothing about it, you know what would have solved the protest? I won't give the answer, all right? Why don't you think and pray about that, all right? Numbers 35, all right? I won't even say it for you, all right? Go to Numbers 35. You know what would have solved that one? Then guess what? Then we would have had a a real summer of love, so to speak, a real peaceful life, and we wouldn't be so paranoid all the time when we go out on the streets. Idiocy, man. Idiocy of our generation, man. That, and uh, this is what you get when you bail out on capital punishment. You notice that, right? This is what happened when you bail out on capital punishment. All right, let's look at Numbers chapter 35. If people knew about that, then what do you think would have happened during the... the Pro t uh, peaceful protest. Maybe they would have behaved better, maybe. Right. Yep. But you got the news media covering their blankety blanks, yeah. Yeah. saying that, oh, oh, look at the cruelty, police brutality, and etc. See, they got brainwashed because they've been so used to, I don't believe in capital punishment. Right. But if you went back to the Stone Age or whatever you want to call it, then the people who are taking other people's lives would have been more careful. So here's the point here, okay? I'm going to cover all the arguments right here. Let's look at Numbers 35, and then uh, I'll wrap it up. If we look at Numbers 35, notice that the Bible says right here that God, He demands it at verse 33, 33. So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are, thank you, America, for blood it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. So life for life, right? So God says that capital punishment is correct. Now some people might say, well, what about people who have a mental condition? They don't deliberately do it. They have no ma uh, malice involved. And I've studied uh, legal classes as well from one of the most liberal universities. I took law and they mention right here for concerning about criminal law and etc. that malice is so important. You have to prove that. That way you can prove them guilty. So then they'll say right here, what about people who don't have that? that in deliberate intention, that malice, or they don't have, uh, they have a mental condition, or there was some understandable situation involved. It's so complex. You can't just say capital punishment and that's it. What about the complex layers in between? Well, hey, stupid, you don't read scripture. Don't you think God understands that at verse 22? But if he thrust him suddenly without enmity, or I've cast upon him anything without laying of weight, so notice right here, no malice, right? Or with any stone wherewith a man may die, seeing him not, and cast it upon him that he die, and was not his enemy, neither sought his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge whither he was fled. Look at right here. Then you can have your Jury, major, uh, jury or your democracy involved right here. They get involved in the decision making over here. Uh, over here, they got like the city of refuge that time, and I'm not telling you to have your own six cities of refuge. That would be quite a lot of running in this technological age. But the point right here is that God understands that there are complex layers and that there's a democratic thinking involved where people think what is best for the situation. See, so that's the pointer right here. So God understands that. Secondly, secondly, what's very important to understand is if you think that this is too cruel or too harsh, even in the complex layers with our legal system, they'll say, well, what other complex layer can you create? You know, it doesn't, we've done the best that we could, and uh, if you do it your way, it's a little bit too strict, too hard. No, the pointer is this. Even if it's too strict and too hard, and you're afraid of taking an innocent life that uh, was involved during... Uh, or maybe not so innocent, I don't know. The issue can be very complex when a person takes another person's life and then you want capital punishment. If we come across a very complex layer, and I'm trying to empathize with the liberals right here, all right? If we're coming across a very complex layer right here where uh, 
It might seem too cruel. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. It is cruel. It's too hard. Maybe the person is more innocent than we thought. The simple answer is this. Those people who seem to be more innocent, the pointer is this, is that they would be more careful with how they treated life. When people start doing that, when they take life very seriously and realize there's a very heavy punishment and crime for that, then people who are in that complex gray area, they're going to be extremely careful. I'm not going to take a life. Imagine how much our world would be a better place than if we had people who are more careful rather than playing victim. That's our world right now, and there is no doubt about that. You got too many in prisons and too many who are involved in crime and issues playing the victim card, okay? And you have to realize that is extremely dangerous because anybody can play that card then. There's a tendency of that. There's a tendency of that, and so we have to realize, no, there's no excuse for my actions involved. Uh, yeah. If we have that kind of mindset, rather than playing a sob story about, you know, my history and what I am, by constantly playing that card, then this will justify, yes, yeah. it will keep up with that one. Yeah. See, because I can justify quitting a ministry right here. I have every right and reason and sob story to tell you of that, but I don't tell you all of that. So you have no idea what's going on in my life, what I went through, neither do I with yours. But the point right here is, is that we, if we resort to that victim card, that's the end. Then the devil wins. He controls your life. And you'll never get victory to conquer uh, bad things in your life. We have to take responsibility over our actions so that we can make a better life for the Lord. And if you got God on your side, what can go wrong? Amen, what can go wrong? So that's extremely important to understand here. Notice uh, at verse 27. See what God says at verse 26? So this is a person who was in that complex gray area, right? What did God say at verse 26? But if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge, whither he was fled, and the revenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge, and the revenger of blood kill the slayer, he shall not be guilty of blood because of verse 28. He should have been more careful because he should have remained in the city of his refuge. You notice that there? So even a person in a complex gray area, God's saying, uh, that this person is still guilty and put to death. Why? Because he should have been more careful right here. So God, he does understand, a uh, he does understand the person's mindset in a complex gray area and it couldn't be helped and the poor individual and some level of innocency. So God gives him some kind of mercy. He tolerates some of that. He gives him a level. But he doesn't give him a complete level or abuse it. He also puts a level of now, play caution too. Play caution too. If we have that, don't you think we'd have a better society, a better legal system? Yeah. So think about that, okay? All right, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's Genesis study have been very helpful, very eye-opening, and that we'll be able to defend our faith even better and understand your rules and your word. And we thank you so much that the rules are in place not to hurt us, but to protect us. Because we're your children, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.